How often have you been warned about being a lukewarm Christian? We certainly have heard it thrown around in Christian circles quite a bit. Where does this phrase come from, and how has it been misapplied? The answers might just surprise you. Welcome to the Happy Holy Hour, a podcast where everyday Christians grow in their faith through biblical examination and insightful discussion. I'm glad you're here today. If you enjoy the content you're about to hear, make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode, and visit us at thehappyholyhour.org. Let's get started. Well, welcome to the Happy Holy Hour, where everyday Christians grow in their faith through biblical examination and insightful discussion. I'm Travis, and I'm here with my guest host, Tyler. Tyler, how's it going, man? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you tonight? I'm doing good. Recovering from uh, a little bit of sickness here, drinking my uh, herbal tea, getting my <laughs> natural remedies in, and so my coffee my uh, second time being sick, kind of almost back to back, kind of strange, but uh, not COVID. Don't worry, people. Before we get started tonight, can I share like a really encouraging message we got through our sure, Facebook page? Sure, on an edifying note. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I got a message, or we got a message from a guy named Shadrach, I believe that's how you pronounce it, in Malawi, which is a country in Africa. He sent us a message that said, I am a big fan of your podcast. I'm a college student studying civil engineering. Most importantly, I'm a Christian. It's amazing to listen to fellow believers from the other side of the world talk about this precious faith. Lord willing, we will meet in person one day. If it will not be in this lifetime, then it will be at the master's feet. Dude, I was like in wow. tears reading this. I was like, that's, that's yeah, amazing. I, that. that was such a, and that was just a snippet of his, of the message he sent us. There was so much more encouraging stuff in there. And, um, I'm always blown away when people are first, if even if it's a critical comment, I'm like, wow, at least you listen to our podcast, yeah. but <laughs> we haven't gotten to any of those, but especially like the encouraging ones, the positive ones, you know, and, and especially when they come from all over the world, places I've never been, you know, you're like, wow, this is, this is crazy. Um, yeah. yeah, it was so encouraging. It's, it's so encouraging to just hear from our listeners and literally all around the world. Like recently we had, um, what every continent we've had listeners? Yeah, every we've been streaming on every continent except for Antarctica, which is the penguins yeah. aren't. Now that aren't would be happy. really cool. That would be hilarious if we actually. Ah, <laughs> uh, that would be awesome. Um, it's encouraging that you know if we don't meet our listeners in this life, we're gonna meet them someday in heaven if they're saved. And it, I don't know. Yeah. That's just such an encouraging thought, and it's also a good reminder and a good time for a little selfless plug that we do. Um take topic suggestions too, because part of the message he sent us, he sent us a whole list of uh, really cool topics that he said, Hey, would you just discuss these on your podcast? And uh, we're hoping to do some of those. And we do take topic suggestions. And we even, if you or someone, you know, would like to be a guest on the podcast, we also have guests on all the time. We're always looking for new guests. So reach out to us, Tyler, what's the best way they can do that? Yeah, so you can go to our website and find our email there, I believe, or just go to happyholyhour at gmail.com or send us a message on any of our social medias and, and we'll get that. See store for details. See store for details. <laughs> but also, you know, if you would prayerfully consider financially supporting us as a podcast, that would be a huge blessing to us and enables us to encourage believers all around the world. So just a little selfless plug there. Um, this is a good reminder that our podcast really, it's, the Lord working through our podcast really does make a difference in people's lives. And that just is really humbling and really blows us away. So, all right, moving on from that heartfelt edifying section of the podcast to our, I don't know what you call this section of our podcast, the, the podcast, podcast game, game. Yes. the arcade. I thought this was pretty clever. My dad joke self, lame self here, my podcast game for this episode is would you prefer hot tea or coffee or iced tea or coffee yeah, i found this question kind of funny because you 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 wrote this down before we started meeting today currently as we're recording you're drinking hot tea and i'm drinking iced tea and that <laughs> would be my answer is that iced is, tea that is hilarious okay well <laughs> right now since i am recovering from a sickness i will have hot tea although i will say this morning i also had hot tea but for dinner i had iced tea so 
actually I can't give, I can't give, um, I hate these kind of questions because there's so many variables, you know, <laughs> you like, made the question. <laughs> I know, I know, I know I did, but I, this, this took me a long time to like finish writing this question because I had to sit there and be like, I don't know, how would I answer? It's and conflicting. they're both very good. They are. And it just depends, you know, like there's something about a hot cup of tea or coffee you know i like both but my body can't handle coffee so now i am an exclusive tea drinker (laughs) sad day you know there's something about a cold winter's day or early morning you know getting up to go to work and having that hot cup of tea or coffee um there's just something about that so nostalgic and comforting but also on a on like a warm summer's day and the sun's shining to have a nice cup of iced tea or Ice coffee. Mm. Some of my, like my like last summer, I went to the cabins in the mountains of Pennsylvania. Me and my brother in law, we put up our hammocks and we just sat there with like you know sweet southern iced tea, and probably had way too much of it, but so good. When you when you start having kidney stone problems, you have to stop drinking so much iced tea. I put so much sugar in my tea; it's ridiculous. I I love like southern style sweet tea. And I will put it in a mason jar, put some ice in it, and sip on it. And during the summertime, like you'll you'll rarely find me without sweet tea in my hand, and it's mm. it's bad. It's bad. For no, but me. I think your family gets lucky though, because I know like your uncle and cousin have been avidly drinking that, and they have never gotten <laughs> kidney stones. They told me that too. Like, I guess so. You might be good. I don't yeah, know. We'll hope. We'll hope. Maybe it doesn't run in my family though. <laughs> I'll let you know. I do not want to. I do not want to get a kidney stone. I've heard that is some people say, and now this, I know all the, the women listening to the podcast who have given birth will not be, it would not agree with me here, but I've heard it said that it hurts worse than being in labor. I don't know. Yeah. I haven't, I I haven't experienced either one. So, (laughs) so cold tea is good. Hot tea is good, but you know, have you ever just let a cup of tea sit out on the counter for a couple of hours and it just becomes this like lukewarm? Yeah, it's not it's not tasty. It's not I think good. I'm picking it, up what you're going, what you're laying down there. Yeah, this I, is, I a, this this. is the cheesy this is Sunday segue. school. Transition. This is the segue. Yes. OK, that was good. <laughs> that was good. I guess you didn't think I didn't think I guess you didn't think my game was good enough. Had to be more cliche. <laughs> be spiritual. No. <laughs> <laughs> be spiritual. Yeah, our topic for today. What is our topic? It's lukewarm. Like our intro was saying, we've heard this word tossed around a lot. I mean, who hasn't been in a youth group setting or somewhere else where, you know, the topic of the day was don't be a lukewarm Christian, you know? Um, and we we had we had heard this. I don't know if you brought it up or I did, but you know, we've both been hearing it within Christian circles a lot lately. And um I don't know how we even how we decided to do a topic on this. It must have come up in conversation somehow. There's going to come a time here soon, I believe, where you can't. How do I say this? Uh, there's a lot of Christians in our culture that are like they say they're Christian, but they're very passive in what they stand for. Uh, and and you know, there's really no. They, they say they're Christian, and it's just kind of a cultural thing at that point. Like there's really Christ is irrelevant at that point. But there's going to come a time where we need to stand on Christ firmly, and um, we're going to have to answer for that. And to be a lukewarm Christian, at least when I grew up, as my understanding was, it was like a you're you're half uh, devout, yeah, you're half hearted yeah. in your belief. It's it's one of those things where like you know, yeah, you're you're on fire for Christ at church, but then at the rest of the week, it's like you're not really committed. Uh, so growing up, that was my understanding of it. So and lately with our culture the way it is. Uh, I thought it'd be an interesting conversation to have. Yeah, and and we were we were actually surprised when we started doing a little studying on this, you know, this phrase lukewarm or lukewarm Christian. Um, one thing that was really surprising is that this um, term is only used once in the Bible um, for how much we talk about it and how much we apply it to different things or how much how often it's picked as a topic. It's actually only used. Uh, in one place in the Bible, and that's Revelation 3.16. And the phrase is actually used by Jesus Christ, who is speaking through John, who's writing the book of Revelation, and it is addressing the church of Laodicea. And this is in the beginning of Revelation, 
and it reads this. It's in Revelation 3, starting in verse 15. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve for your, to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Man, those are some that's stinging some, words there that's from our savior. Harsh words. Yeah, that's we, we got to take this seriously. I, I, you know, as we go through this passage, as we look at the background and the context and some thoughts on this, it can be really easy to say like, "Oh, I'm not lukewarm," and move on from it. However, let's let's really take what Jesus is saying to heart tonight, and uh, as we discuss this, let's be warned um, so that you know we can defend against that kind of thing happening in our lives as the spirit works in us and also so that we can warn others of the same thing happening in their lives. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. The background of uh this passage or, or the surrounding context is this is part of the book of Revelation and it is Jesus Christ personally addressing seven churches and each and each church he addresses separately and he has his own like personal admonishments or encouragements, but Laodicea, this is the last in the series of, of the seven churches. And it's the only church that Jesus Christ has only negative things to say about. So the other churches, um, I think there might be, is it only one that he has only positive things to say about? And then the others, it's some good, some bad. But unfortunately, with the church of Laodicea, he doesn't have anything positive to say about it. So it kind of, it kind of goes from, from good, to this is the worst. He ends with the worst one here. Um, and the history of Laodicea, it's a city in Asia Minor, which is now uh, modern day Turkey. It's near the Church of Colossae and it's very rich and very influential. Um, this church, <laughs> this church, the church in Laodicea um, had an extensive water system. I was listening to John MacArthur talk about it and he was sharing how um, this the Laodicea didn't have any natural water sources around it that were drinkable. And so they had to uh, pipe it in with an aqueduct from farther away. But what's interesting is this was actually an underground aqueduct, very extensive water system that came into a main holding tank, then went out. Um, so if you're into engineering or anything like that, <laughs> ancient history, it was really, really interesting. Um, but it was known for its bad water, even though they, they had to ship it in from um, farther away, um, it wasn't very good drinking water. Um, it was so wealthy. I, m I mentioned that it was wealthy, but it was so wealthy that it actually refused an offer from Rome to rebuild the city after an earthquake. So they chose to rebuild it from their own finances. They were rich enough to completely rebuild the city off of just their own finances. And even though Rome offered them uh, assistance, they actually refused it because they wanted to to do it um, themselves. It was a very rich city, very pomp city, um, very richly ad adorned and very Romish. Um, so instead of pulling from some of the kind of uh, stern, uh, kind of more plain Greek um, thinking and culture, they, they had a lot of extravagant kind of Romish uh, attire and the, the way they did their buildings and everything. Um, it was also known for its famous medical school. They had a lot of philosoph philosophers there. They had a very famous medical school, which was actually known for producing a salve for, eye, for as eye ointment um, that was used all over the world at that time. And it was also known for its wool industry. Um, they produced especially this black wool that they used, and then they actually exported it all over the world as well. And it also had a large uh, Jewish population. So a lot of the population there was actually Jewish. Um, and then eventually the church of Laodicea would be destroyed um, by the Turks and Mongols. So 
that's a little bit of a background to the city itself. So while the city was happening, it seemed like a very vibrant place, very wealthy. Uh, it was spiritually, what we're finding is spiritually dead. And um, yeah. I think you when you wrote down some interesting thoughts actually from John MacArthur, and I'll let you go through this, but man, like it was interesting to see his thoughts on this on this church's situation. Yeah, I mean, before we go to his thoughts, just to summarize, um, it is it is noted that you know even though um, it had a large Jewish population, a lot of these Jews were known as being pretty lax in their relig- religiosity, and like you said, they they had it all. You know, they were they were rich and wealthy. They had all the finances. They were very wise and knowledgeable. They had all this worldly knowledge. Um, you know, they were powerful. And so they really, they, they were the, they were the people to be at that time. Um, but yeah, I, I was, uh, listening to, uh, a lecture given by John, John MacArthur on this passage. And I, I really did think he had some good points here. So I, I did jot down a couple. Um, he notes that even though this was the worst church in the list, it was also the proudest church. You know, they weren't uh, willing to admit their true condition. Um, going back to our passage, you know, it, it, um, he's Christ speaking about the church says, you say that I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing. And in reality, and you won't realize this, but you're wretched, you're pitiable, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. You're the opposite of what you think you are spiritually. You, you're all these wretched things, and yet you think you're you're the best out there. They were having, he says, the same issues, issues and heresy that the Church of Colossae was having, and they were questioning the deity of Christ. So if you go book to the book of Colossae, you'll see um, several places where Paul says, read this letter that I've given to you, read it to the Church of Laodicea, and a couple other places he mentions Laodicea. So um, we can draw from that that they were having some of these same issues that Paul knew that um, Laodicea needed to address even even then. So this wasn't necessarily the issues they were having in the book of Revelations um, they were having for some time. MacArthur kind of summarizes like what is a Laodicean church? It's an unconverted church because it had a warp, warped view of Christ. And I thought that was really key when understanding this passage, a lot of it has to do with how they viewed Christ. Um, Unlike other churches that had a remnant that were still faithful, this church didn't have anything. And some of the other churches, they had some who were apostatizing or some who were in grievous sin. And yet he does say, you know, there's, there's a remnant here that are being faithful or that are um, clean and not unclean, but here there's no one, you know, he's addressing them. He says earlier in this passage, he says, I know your deeds, you know, and normally he says, I know your deeds. And then says, some are good, some are bad. He's saying, I know your deeds. And then he doesn't have anything good to say. He just, you know, he knows their deeds and they're all um, evil and wicked in his sight. So there's no, there's no good left in them. Um, so really this church was just a church in name only. They were unregenerate. Um, they weren't really a true church. He does bring out some really interesting historical points. Uh, earlier I mentioned that the, uh, the city of Laodicea had an extensive water system, had to pipe in water from farther away, but they were known for having uh, still bad water. Well, it was near to two other cities. Um, one was Colossae and um, one city had hot water, actually hot springs that were um, known for being uh, healing. And actually, they're still used for that today. Um, so they have like minerals that are for medicinal uses. And then uh, Colossae had really refreshing, cold, fresh springs. And so um, and so when you read this passage, the original audience would have very clearly picked up on this uh, neither hot nor cold. Well, the two neighboring cities, um, one had um, useful hot water and one had used for cold water. But the Church of Laodicea, some historians actually say that the water wasn't just bad for drinking. Um, it was actually literally lukewarm and it could cause nausea and even vomiting and sickness. So it really wasn't good drinking water. And I thought that was really interesting and that would be kind of key to understanding um, the meaning of the text. And we'll get into that a little later. 
But as far as the spiritual significance of neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm, that that um, phrase there, uh, John MacArthur says it's not so much saying that Christ wishes they were believers or unbelievers, good or bad. Christ is saying, you make me sick. Um, he says to the churches who lost their first love, he was disappointed. To those who compromised and were in sin, he was angry. But to this church, this church made him literally sick. It was revolting to him. And I was like, that's pretty, um, that that's pretty was hardcore. Like, wow. like, yeah. To hear that. I, oh, man. Like, it almost makes you speechless thinking about the things that Christ has dealt with. Like at this point, he's dealt with sin <laughs> on the cross. Right. Yeah. And he's dealt with all these things. And he's getting to this one. He's like, it's reviling like the yeah. language, the way you read this, it's reviling. Yeah. I mean, just thinking of like, like Jesus Christ, our savior and for him to say, you, you make me sick, you know, like it's revolting to me. You make me want to throw up like that. That's what, that's the, the emotion that he's conveying there. Um, and, and to the fact that it, it is so severe, you know, his, his, he is angry to those who are in sin, and that's not um, that's not to be taken lightly. But this is a special uh, I don't need the the word you would use for it. You know, it's just like a really it's a really unique situation here, and I think we have to think about this too, and and try to answer this question right. Like we just talked about how Christ has dealt with sin. Uh, we're at this point now, though, where he's saying this church is neither hot nor cold. It's lukewarm, and I'm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Yeah. That's interesting to me because when I read that, I'm like, you know, that doesn't – when when you read the words of Paul about salvation in Christ and how we are sealed in Christ and secure, well, being spewed out of Christ's mouth doesn't feel very secure. So I this, this pushed us to ask this question – are, are Christians that are lukewarm really Christians at all? And, and, you know, the first thing that pops into my mind when I think about this idea of lukewarm Christianity, we talk specifically about where the Laodicean church was putting their dependence, right? They were putting it on themselves, on their wealth, on their extravagance. They, they took it off of Christ and put it on themselves. And, um, it makes me think of the modern, maybe progressive church movement today where like rather than putting their dependence and their hope in Christ, it's more on my modern philosophies and my modern cultural standards. And um, it, it just makes me wonder, right? Like in this context that we're looking at in Revelation, these lukewarm Christians, w were they really Christians at all? What do, you, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's – that's um that's a good question. And I think maybe the starting point to to answering that question and understanding this passage and what he means uh, is kind of looking at what does he mean by lukewarm? And that's where there's like some debate back and forth. And I think there's kind of two ways of looking at this. The first one is that hot and cold are opposites. He says, you're neither hot nor cold, you're lukewarm. Um, and, and the first way would be that hot and cold, like I said, they're opposite. So it's good or bad or saved and unsaved, faithful or unfaithful. So I, I wish you were, you were either saved or unsaved. You know, I wish you were, um, a Christian or an atheist, uh, that kind of thinking. Um, and so lukewarm becomes a representation of indifference, laziness, unfaithful, so that they're, they're Christians but they're not good Christians kind of thing. And the second one would be to think of hot and cold as they're the same thing. So that, um, and that kind of goes back to the, um, what I was saying earlier about the, the neighboring cities where hot water was useful and good and cold water is useful and good. So they're both good things, both representing those who are saved um, or or usefulness and making lukewarm the opposite thing. So instead of hot and cold being opposites, they're the same thing. And the opposite of cold or hot is lukewarm. And that would um, symbolize not being useful or the unre unregenerate believer. It, does that make sense at all? Yeah, I grew up uh, having a very clear understanding of the second point there, that mm -hmm. hot and cold are the same thing. They're useful. Uh, you have purpose and use for hot water. You have purpose and use for cold water. But when something is lukewarm, 
the usefulness kind of goes away. There's no real value to it. Um, and yeah, that's kind of the way I understood it. Yeah. And I, and I think that is the one I would, I would lean towards is the, the latter understanding of the term lukewarm. I think it fits best with the surrounding context and, and, uh, especially the historical context and the understanding that the readers would have when you look at this and then, um, other points in there that, um, tie in with, uh, the historical context so clearly. Um, I think this is the only one that really makes sense. I think the first way to look at it is how it often gets used. Um, you know, don't be a lukewarm Christian. Well, the only way that makes sense is if you're interpreting it the, the first way that it's, it's better to be unregenerate than to be this half-hearted Christian or something like that, or a backsliding Christian or however they interpret it. Um, but I think it's really not necessarily talking about like associating with lukewarm with Christian Um and and we can get into that a, a little more. Um, John MacArthur's, uh, you know, summarizing these things and explaining both these these ways of looking at it. He says, well, it doesn't really matter necessarily what hot or cold means, but to say that they served no purpose, they had no use. There is there is a a, a sense, and he also says this, and where like, um, in some ways, it is better to be an atheist than to be a apostate Christian, which really means you were never a Christian in the first place, you know, to have tasted, you know, of the goodness and, and then to, to leave the faith, um, to, to, to hear the gospel, know the gospel, be among believers, uh, sharing some of the benefits and then to leave that, you know, uh, you, you, um, you'll be judged more harshly. Um, so that there is that sense there too. Um, but I think the, the main point of this passage is not to talk about half-hearted Christians. Um, it's addressing um, apostate, an, an apostate church, not even individuals necessarily, but a, a corporate body of believers who went apostate. And he also says the problem with those who are unbelievers who want to come together as as so-called as a so-called church is that they are in no position to understand their spiritual position and reality. The basis for this church's own identity was a baseless fiction. They thought they possessed not only material wealth, but spiritual wealth. So he says they were really involved in a sort of pre-Gnosticism. Um, and it really went back to their understanding and denying the deity of Christ. That was the root issue that was going on here. It's interesting, like like you mentioned earlier, this is kind of the worst state for someone to be in for this this church. They had this this apostasy they 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 knew about christ and in a way they kind of created a false christ and we kind of we see this a lot today in our churches i'm reminded of a lot of major church denominations out there that kind of they they know christ they they've read the bible they they see that but they might not agree with it so then they start to rely on their own understanding of who christ is or what they yeah. really want him to be i should say and they they create a baseless fiction based on that, and they they follow some they they just like what's happening in this this church they they have removed their dependence from Christ onto their own idea yeah. of what Christ might actually and, look like, and ultimately that's themselves. Yeah, and and not only that, but you know he says this is the ultimate apostasy. You know, not only do they they know uh, of the gospel and of Christ and His word, they know about these things, but they, you know, create a false Christ, a creative false gods. They deny all these things and they do it smugly. They they are taking pride. You know, the Church of Laodicea took pride in who they were and and um, knowing these things and then de denying them. And and you and I think that that is what you see, you know, in a lot of these churches who say, you know, we we know better than the Bible. We we have science. We have these things. And you know, they want to call themselves Christians, but removed Christ, you know, and and say, well, he was, you know, a good teacher, all these other things to pull him from all these other religions. You know, that there is a, a sense of arrogance there where, you know, the Bible is kind of this unreliable older document, ancient document and all these things, you know, somehow we know better than God and we know better than Christ. Um, we know better than all of church history kind of thing. We're, we're the ones with this, you know, true knowledge now with our advanced minds. <laughs> um, it's really the same hard attitude that the church of Laodicea was having.
Yeah, like once they deny Christ, which ultimately when you when you think you have a better version of Christ in your head, right? You 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 deny Christ and you deny the scripture, I guess you're moving back into Laodicea, right? Yeah. It's it's kind of wild. Yeah, so I I think, you know, in summary, these are non-Christians in a church that's really a non-Christian church. It's really a non-church. And Christ is saying, you need to turn to me. You need yeah. um, you need the clothing and the riches and healing that the world cannot ever offer. Um, you need what is unperishable. You know, you're living yeah. for that which is perishable. You need to turn to me and, and have that which is unperishable. Unper- and what is really cool here is when you look about the history, the historical context he's really he's tearing down everything that they're building their life upon they're known for their clothing export tears that down you know he says you need the white garments you know and i love how they're known for this black wool and he says you know you don't need the black wool you need the white garments that i can provide um and they're known for their riches (laughs) he says you are in poverty you are poor you need the riches that i provide tears that down um you know you're known for the medical salve for your eyes he says you need the salve for your spiritual eyes that only i can provide you know tears that down every anything that they think that they are taking pride in um he he rips he (laughs) rips that off tears that tears down that idol and says you need what only i can give you Mark Bates from Ligonier, he's, he summarizes this up really well, I think. He says, the lukewarm person is not one who is just mildly passionate about God. Rather, the lukewarm person is one who has lost his dependence on God, really never had it. In his arrogance, he believes he has no need of Christ's righteousness because he has enough of his own. Unless we see that we are poor and needy, Jesus will have no part of us. Be ruthless in rooting out spiritual pride. Remember, that's really the core issue, what Laodicean church was dealing with, spiritual pride. Remember that Jesus is nauseated by our self-righteousness. Whenever you are feeling self-sufficient, ask God to open your eyes to see your own nakedness. When you see your own bankruptcy, cry out to Jesus so that you may delight in the riches of his grace. So, Travis, uh, I, I'm going to ask a question. We just went through all of this. So can Christians be lukewarm? I guess another way to ask this is, is a Christian that's lukewarm really a Christian at all? And before we get too far, I I think I, I don't want to be too definitive to make a claim on something that we haven't studied extensively. Uh, we've studied it pretty in depth over the past week or so, but uh, it looks like it's extremely difficult, right? For a true follower of Christ to be lukewarm in this passage, it seems it seems like the lukewarmness that that that's being referred to are, you know, these are not true believers. He's, this is clearly shown by the fact, in my mind, at least that Jesus will spew them out of his mouth. He does not forsake those who are his own. Right. True believers. He seals them into that day of redemption. So i'm I'm thinking here that this lukewarmness is referring to non-believers, but we need to be careful, right? It is possible for Christians just to become complacent and might, they might need a loving push towards treasuring Christ. And somebody in the pub said this earlier today we we all have hills and valleys in our pilgrim journey, but he will not forsake his people. Christ by his spirit will strengthen us. so, Reminder, I guess, right? Don't just go accusing people that might seem lukewarm <laughs> uh, that they're unsaved. Don't don't just go accusing people of that, but keep sharing the gospel faithfully. Keep praying and trust the Lord that he will do his redemptive work in those in your community. So I, I know I grew up with kind of a different understanding of what lukewarmness is. And uh, studying this has been a journey. It's been fun. Uh, and we still have a lot to get through in today's episode. Yeah, I... um you know, I'm, I'm kind of with you there. I actually feel, I feel pretty comfortable and I'll, I'll put a little clause in there. Um, but I say, I'll, I'll feel pretty comfortable saying that, um, if, if we use lukewarm, uh, as this context is using it for the Christian, we're, we're probably misusing the term. I think 
the way we oftentimes use lukewarm may be fine, but not if we're basing it on this passage. I don't think a Christian can fit into the category of lukewarm as it's described here. It's not just describing a Christian who's in sin or who needs a wake-up call or who's going through those hills and valleys, which does happen. And if you want to call it luke like that being lukewarm, I just don't think that's um, the way this, this is not what the passage is talking about. And so if you're looking at it that way, no, a Christian can't be lukewarm as it's described here. He, Christ gives a clear description of what lukewarm means. You know, it, it goes that you're neither hot nor cold lukewarm, but then it goes into like, what does that mean? And a true Christian can't fit that category. You know, a true Christian has been clothed in the white garments. A true Christian has have been clothed in the righteousness and given the riches of Christ and has his eyes open. Um, and so I just don't think a true Christian, someone who's actually saved can fit into that lukewarm category as is described here. Um, I, I think like it is true that there are believers who need a wake up call who are, are in sin or are going through this hills and valleys. Um, and there are other passages to use and to apply to those struggling believers and 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 some of those passages and some of those descriptions are actually used of these other seven churches so um but you can use those passages so we don't really need to use this passage to describe a christian uh you know who's struggling uh yeah. that's not the point of this one now there are people and there are quote unquote churches who i think this text does describe and speak to today and there are, there are a lot of them um but i think they're not true churches and they're not true christians they're they are uh, apostized christians or apostized churches so that that's where i yeah at. no that's a great point and i think there's a lot of clarity in that and i i i do appreciate that and i think that's really that's a really good way of understanding it and of course we still have a lot to learn i mean yeah we're all we're all growing in our spiritual journey but so the Christian might have seen this episode and, you know, you might have been like, am I a lukewarm Christian, right? And using the understanding that many of us have grown up understanding where lukewarm might just mean maybe you're half hearted in your devotion to Christ, which uh, you need to rededicate that... your life to Christ. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But what we've just read is that lukewarm is really not, it doesn't mean that in particular, but we still want to give you some idea of how do you know if you're in need of a wake up call or how do you know if you are quote unquote lukewarm or really even saved at all? And so I have some bullet points here that I, I want us to add. These are really self-reflective questions that I think might be helpful for you as you look at your own spiritual journey and realize where you might need to make some adjustments. I know just preparing these questions, <laughs> I was like, I need to stop kicking myself in the yeah, well, throat I think, with these questions. I do want to pause here and think, I like we shouldn't just write off, you know, this thing. Like it should be a warning to the church. Absolutely. Um, this this church wasn't always an apostized church. You know, I think you can almost see the progression here where they were dealing with some of this heresy and it was infiltrating mm -hmm. the church, you know, and, and Paul wrote to them um trying to correct this thing. And so they didn't just start where they're at here when Christ is confronting them. And and this has been a generational thing. So yeah. that's a that should be a warning. Like uh, us as local buyers of believers, we need to look at Laodicea and say, like, we're not above like going there. You know, we need to be on guard. This is why doctrine and, and theology is so important and church discipline. You know, a generation later, your local church could be an apostate church. There's lots of them in America. Yeah. There's lots of them all over the world right now who didn't start off that way. I think these are some questions then we can ask. How do you, how can you keep yourself from going down that path that yeah. this church of Laodicea might've gone there? How, how do you, how do you do a, like a health check right now in your spiritual life? Right? So I have a couple of questions that I, they're, they're more of like self-reflective questions. So I'm going to, I'm going to go through these and just think through it. Uh, number one, this directly relates to the church in Laodicea. Are you self-satisfied or are you relying on Christ? See, these this lukewarm ideology, this lukewarm concept tends to they tend to live their way, their lives in a way where they are able to seemingly seemingly satisfy themselves and never rely on the mercies of Christ. And it 
if and when they hit hard times, they might seemingly lose their faith. <laughs> and if this happens to you, you might be relying on yourself more than Christ, just like the Laodiceans uh, that, that led them to the state of being lukewarm and considered useless, honestly. Um, so we don't want to go there. Number two, do you really want to be saved from your sin? Or do you really just want to be saved from the penalty of your sin? And this is going to help us understand what our heart's desire really is. If you just want to be saved from the penalty of your sin and not from your sin itself, you might need to reevaluate reevaluate whether or not it's Christ that you really desire. Number three, do you desire holiness? Now, what I didn't just ask you is, do you want to just sin less? I ask, do you want your life to be a radical transformation from sinner to saint holiness that's what we strive that's what we long for and we can only have it it, through the finished work of christ not our own efforts (laughs) we know from previous studies that we've done that only true christians will have this desire to strive for true holiness in christ so ask yourself that do you desire holiness number four what do you think about more life here on earth or eternity in heaven? What do you value more? You know, the Laodiceans, they seem to really desire their possessions. They they really found a lot of value in that. They found value in their social status. They found value in their wealth. Um, and these things clearly occupied their minds more than their hope of heaven, which led them to the state of being lukewarm. So Again, we, we, we can learn from that mistake, right? We don't want to go down that path. Value Christ more than your things, right? Number five, are you sharing your faith with people? <laughs> I love what Spurgeon says. He says, you're either a missionary or an imposter. <laughs> you can't get more clear than that. But are you sharing your faith with people? That's such a clear uh, indicator on whether or not you really cherish and treasure your faith. And I know that's convicting, but you know it's convicting for me as well. And lastly, number six, are you giving to your church money, right? Financially, are you tithing? And and I've struggled with this one. What is your attitude towards giving? Are you a cheerful giver? Or are you begrudgingly giving? The church in Laodicea seemed to value their stuff a lot. And if they valued their stuff more than they valued heaven, uh, who's to say they were giving, right? And nothing breaks the power of money more than giving. (laughs) So think about these things. A.W. Tozer once preached, there's an entire generation of Christians coming who believe that it is impossible to receive Christ without forsaking the world. Uh, You know, the sign of a genuine saving faith is a passion, passionate commitment to knowing and serving God, uh, the people of God and the mission of God. It's, it's forsaking the world and pursuing Christ. And, and if you're feeling like really beat up in this episode so far, I just want to encourage you um, from John Piper. He says, lukewarm does not mean true Christians don't have seasons of languishing. It means true saints, true saints don't settle in with mediocrity and say, I am rich. I am prospered. I need nothing. I just do this religious thing and I'll be fine. No, no, no. A true Christian has an ongoing sense that in himself, he is wretched. He is pitiable. He is poor. He's blind, naked. Therefore, he is ever turning to Jesus for gold (laughs) and for clothing and for the salve for his eyes. So it's relying on Christ. It's that dependence on Christ rather than me, myself, and I and my things, right? It's that turning towards Christ. And how do we stop? being lukewarm how do if we notice we're going down this path where we're relying on ourselves more than we're relying on christ how do we stop that how do how do we stop from going that way really this is how do we be a christian (laughs) right and there's really five easy not easy but there's five steps here that i want us to be very clear about number one is repent repent of your sin recognize it understand it for what it is and that's treason hate it (laughs) turn from it walk away from it and run to Christ. Repent. Number two, and this is the challenge, right? Believe in Christ. No, like actually believe it, ponder it, meditate it, rejoice in what Christ has done on the cross to save you from God's wrath. Literally pray Psalm 51, 12. It says, restore in me the joy of my salvation. Yeah, I think this one is the key one here, Tyler, Um, especially like really getting to the heart of lukewarmness. You know, if this is this passage is talking to apostate um, church and apostate people and 
people who really had denied the deity of Christ, they had their foundation off. You know, the the key to not being lukewarm is to have the right foundation. Um, and Christ is our foundation. Uh, the problem was they didn't know Christ or had the right view of him outwardly. They might've been looking like a church. They might've doing all the, they might've been doing all the right religious things, you know, but without Christ as their head, they weren't a true church, you know, and without Christ as our head, we're not a part of the true church either. So believing in mm -hmm. Christ, you know, <laughs> being a true Christian um, is, is the key to not being lukewarm. Yeah. That's, seriously like step one like it, it's so it's so crucial to this point and um we've done a lot of episodes on what christ has done uh you know god sent him christ he lived a perfect life uh, that we can't live that we couldn't live and he died on the cross to take the penalty of your sin and he rose from the dead so that we can have eternal life and and spend eternity with christ and um believe that you know he he took your sin to the cross and uh, that's the beauty of the gospel. And that leads me to my third point, which is read God's word faithfully. God's word is living and active, and it possesses the power to change lives. And it can change yours too. So if you're feeling beat up, like you're not sure what next steps to take, open that Bible. I know it can be really easy to let it collect dust on a shelf, um, but that's how we hear from God, right? It's a lot of times as Christians, we can be... We can be all upset sometimes, like, why Why am I not hearing from God? Well, a lot of times it's because our Bible has not been opened. Uh, so how do, we, how do we keep from going down this lukewarm path? Spend time in the Word. So we got repent, believe, read God's Word, and pray, right? We just said that reading God's Word is the way for God to speak to us. Well, prayer is how we speak to God, right? God promises to give wisdom, for example, to those who ask for it. Think about a father who has a child that's asking him to help him grow. In my head, that's such a beautiful picture. I mean, Travis, I'm sure you can resonate. You know, you picture your kids someday as they're getting older and they say, Dad, help me grow in this way. I imagine that that would just about melt your heart as a father. <laughs> Am I wrong? <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> obedient little saints. Oh, man. Really? Yeah. Uh, so we got repent, believe, Read God's word, pray, and lastly, but not definitely not least, but devote yourself to a local church and active service. You know, learn, have fellowship, serve. A local church is God's plan A when it comes to salvation and sanctification of his people. So don't skip out on these things, right? We, we learned a lot tonight about lukewarmness. It may not have been what you thought it was going to be, <laughs> right, Travis? Okay, no, can I just add like one, maybe six point on there is, is defend the Absolutely, faith, yeah. you know, defend the Ooh, faith, yeah. um, uh, you know, sound doctrine, sound theology, church discipline, you know, guard the sheep from the wolves. Um, I think this is where it starts. Heresy crept in, you know, apostate Christians crept in and they spoiled the whole lump. You know, and eventually it led to a whole apostate church. And so, you know, we have to know the truth, live the truth, and then defend the truth. Um, yes, absolutely. I guess that's my last little. <laughs> last little well, and it's interesting because we would talk there earlier about maybe a misconception of lukewarmness was like it's a misconception of it is that it might be defined as like half-hearted devotion to Christ, mm -hmm. but I don't think that's all wrong i think devotion to something else maybe <laughs> well it's it's not just that but like think about where apostasy starts mm -hmm. it it's a slippery slope of relying on yourself maybe more than christ maybe a half-hearted devotion to christ i feel like is definitely a part of that journey of being apostate mm -hmm. of getting to that point where they're lukewarm and right. they're useless. <laughs> right. But I think, I so, think like not having the right foundation in the first place causes that, yes. you know, you can have this Absolutely. false sense of security and this false devotion and passionate. Um, but that if it, if it's not true, if you're not convect, uh, connected to the vine, eventually it's going to die out and wither. Um, and yes. you will start to, to fall away because you were never there in the first place. We need Christ. We need Christ more than more than our salve for our eyes. We need we need Christ more than the water that we drink. We need Christ more than the air that we breathe. We need Christ more than the clothes that are on our back. 
Uh, and for many of us, he's, he's graced us with these gifts and, yeah. and we thank him for that. The but, living water uh, clothed in his yeah. righteousness. Yeah. Exactly. So that today is an interesting episode. Yeah, man. A lot, a lot from just like, what does lukewarm Christian mean? Let us down that. <laughs> Oh, I, I thought this was going to be an easy episode. Yeah. Well, it was interesting. <laughs> it out very difficult. Yeah. yeah. So uh, thank you for joining us today on the Happy Holy Hour. Remember, if you have any questions about any of this or you want to have a deeper conversation with one of us about what it means to be a Christ follower, please don't hesitate to reach out. Our email is happyholyhour at gmail.com. Send us an email or connect with us over the social medias, and we would be glad to connect with you in that way. You can also leave us a voicemail at our voicemail inbox at 484-961-0434. We're not going to pick up the phone and put you on the spot, but it's just going to go right directly into an inbox. You can leave us a audio message. So send us your questions, send us your comments. We'd love to address them on the show. Remember to subscribe in your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. Leave a review so others can find us. And uh, consider leaving a financial donation to help us continue this show uh, another week. That would be greatly appreciated. And lastly, visit our website for some really helpful resources. Oh, man, my tea's lukewarm. Man, me too. The ice melted. Oh, man. <laughs> All right. See you next week, everybody. Ooh.